Hello, this is Robert Rickover. I'm an Alexander Technique teacher in Omaha, Nebraska. And my guest today is Amanda Cole, who is a an Australian performer, researcher, and writer, music educator. She's currently a, a research fellow at Griffith University in Brisbane. Notice I got that pronunciation yeah. <laughs> correct, right? She's won numerous awards for creative projects, um, research projects, and professional development. She has a doctorate in performing arts pedagogy from Griffith University and a master's in music performance from the University of Melbourne. I believe you have a master's in teaching. I do. Teaching pedagogy, would that be how it would be phrased? Or? Uh, it's... Well, my my PhD was more actually. Kathy Madden pointed out that pedagogy is to do with children, so it's an oh, odd word to oh, use I for adult that. education. Um, and si but since she pointed that out, I I um, which I totally agree with. Um, but but it tend, but it's funny because pedagogy tends to be used for adult education. Yes, um, that's what I've always and thought. that was what my PhD was in. I then. But but in Australia, in order to teach in a class in a school in a classroom, you have to have a master's of teaching, right? Which is which is got pedagogy in it, but it's not called pedagogy. The the degrees that use pedagogy tend to be postgraduate degrees. Well, whatever it is, uh, among Amanda's research projects is one of great interest to the Alexander world. And it can, it's pretty much all in this book, uh, which you can all see. Yeah, Marg about Marjorie Barstow and others. And um, she has, uh, this book is based on a lot of interviews she's done, plus a lot of letters between uh, Mar between Marjorie Barstow, Frank Pierce Jones, F.M. Alexander, and um, Professor John Dewey, and um, that have, as far as I know, never really seen the light of day before. And I wanted to, we, we've done three podcasts already. I think we're going to do a few more, but today I I think we should talk about inhibition. Uh, a key Alexander concept, and in particular about Marge's um, and probably Frank Pierce Jones's uh, concerns about the, the some versions of inhibition. So uh, I'm reading from page 102 of your book, Amanda. Mm -hmm. um, and you write, Barstow noticed that students and teachers who attempted to inhibit an old behavior pattern without applying a new plan of response to a stimulus other than nothing, were becoming stiff. In a letter to Jones, Frank Pierce Jones, in 1947, Barstow likens the isolation of inhibition with the isolation of the Alexander brothers, so FM and AR, from the rest of the world. And here's her, here, here, some of her exact words. It will all, this is Marge writing a letter to Frank Pierce Jones. It will always be a puzzle to me why FM and AR allowed so much stiffness to develop in their pupils and never seemed too troubled about it. FM much less so than AR. It must have been partly due to the fact that they isolated themselves so from the rest of the world. As I look back, they did live in a little world of their own, always doing exactly as they wished and those who disagreed were pushed out always being the center of praise and never being jolted out of it does do strange things to people. It is, it is easy to get used to certain things and accept them. Many times it is the easiest way out. Even so, it's all a curious situation. 
So Marge is talking about a certain characteristic of parts of the Alexander world back in the mid to late 40s, I guess. That's the rough period when she was writing. And I got to say, as a teacher of for many years and having having encountered teachers of a lot of different traditions and been exposed to them myself in quite a bit of detail, um, there's there are elements of that that are still, I think, quite present in the Alexander world. And um, but in particular, with regard to inhibition, the idea that if someone were, was going to attempt to inhibit in the sort of classical way, they often would end up sort of becoming stiff. And how how do you see that whole phenomenon and what's your take on it? Uh, well, I, 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 as I was saying to you this morning in an email, this chapter is kind of long. Um, uh, well, it's not kind of long. It's just dense. And so I've written 10 pages about inhibition and I started off by looking at Alexander's various definitions of an inhibition in his different books and he changed his definition. And I think that's where one of the problems um, mm -hmm. with his work mm -hmm. came about, which is he kept using the same word, but he privately changed his definition of it. And well, and not just privately, he he gave different definitions in his different works without signaling the fact that he changed them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, for example, in MSI, I found Alexander saying that to inhibit meant to prevent the subconscious habit from happening so that new ways of doing can occur in their place. And then in CCC, his second book, he said, this really means that in the application of my technique, the process of inhibition, that is, and then he explains it, the act of refusing to respond to the primary desire to gain an end becomes the act of responding. So this is, this is where I think that... Um, that this is the definition that Marge used. He then went on in, in yeah. Use of the Self uh, to say, to describe the need to inhibit the misdirection associated with the wrong habitual use of my head and neck when the stimulus came to me to use my voice. Mm -hmm. So that is, he says, I should be stopping off at its source my unsatisfactory reaction to the idea of reciting, which expressed itself in pulling back the head, depressing the larynx and sucking in breath. Um, so, and, and then I went on to, to describe the fact that I, in looking at these different definitions, I identified the possibility or the fact that he used, he did use this nothing phase as a temporary phase and Marge then questioned whether that was even necessary. And it was actually on an interview that you did with, now I can't remember whether it was Michael Frederick. Probably Michael else. Frederick, I'm guessing. One of you, uh, who I may not mention this, I quote it in the book, I just can't remember exactly who said what. One of you likened, said that Marge likened it to doing a U-turn on the freeway. Yeah, I read that. Actually, a little correction here. Yes. Go um, that was, uh, what had happened was Marge was asked in front of a very large group getting close to lunchtime, people were dozing off. But someone said, Marge, how come you never talked about inhibition. And of course, everyone sprung to awareness because it's true that the word, I don't believe I ever actually heard her before then use that word. But she said after a long pause, well, that's all I ever talk about. And then she went on to say something along, I wish I had the exact quote, I don't, but something along the lines, if well, if inhibition is not doing something you don't want to do, then if you do something else, that should take care of it. And I was the one who, who thought about this for a while. And I thought, well, you're driving down a highway and you realize you're going the wrong way. That could happen. Uh, how do you inhibit that? Well, you don't just do an immediate U-turn. 
it's just not possible really on most like a two lane highway. So what you would probably do is pull off to the shoulder and assess the situation in terms of traffic. And if there were no cars coming for some distance, then you could, you wouldn't even have to stop. You just slow down and do a U-turn and you're going back the other way. Or you might have to stop for a little bit because if there are a lot of cars coming, that's not a great maneuver. And I thought that kind of encapsulated what Marge was about with inhibition. And um, in the Alexander world more broadly, the question that has often appeared in discussion groups and debates and so on, is inhibition an activity or is it no activity? Is it a noun or is it a verb almost? And I would say Marge would have come down pretty strongly on the verb side of things. Whereas some teachers, I think a lot of teachers today, see it as a complete straight up stop. And you don't do anything. Which is still a verb. Is it a that verb? That stopping is a verb. Stop, to stop, stop is still a verb. Yeah, you're right. Maybe <laughs> it's the just grammatical. that we won't go there because it's not. That's it's not, not, interesting. not worth. Um, <laughs> what I thought about when you were talking was that what why I wrote this book really and why I did the PhD and it is because of my own personal experience. So I I had quite a lot of experience of uh, lessons where I was my teachers didn't use the word inhibit, but I effectively I was they were trying to get me to stop a pattern and I would get stuck on that mm -hmm. and then when I encountered Kathy Madden's teaching I didn't get stuck anymore I just got better at singing and and the Alexander technique made total sense to me and it wasn't just because my singing got better it was because I understood what what the um the words meant and I understood how to use them and I understood how to apply them and, and everything else just fell away. And so that to me was just, like, it was a, just a revelation to me that I could actually, after 10 years of, of and it, look, it was useful. I wouldn't have kept on going with it for 10 years. Sure, absolutely. Um, but it was confusing and it was frustrating in that sometimes it would work and sometimes it wouldn't. Sometimes I would have an amazing experience and I would hang on to it in my practice room at home and try and reproduce it and get nowhere. And so it was, it was Kathy's, you know, understanding where, I mean, and obviously Kathy is, is, has added her own uh, levels of clarity to, to what she learned from Marge. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I want to give her credit as well. Um, <laughs> If she wasn't writing her own books, I'd write a book about Kathy as well. <laughs> she doesn't need a book about her. Yeah. Um, so I, it was just such a massive difference in terms of its usefulness to me as a performer. Yeah. That I, that I realised I'd been spending a lot of time thinking about unconstructive and um, not very useful activities. That felt quite nice sometimes and... Um, you know, they gave me a little bit of support when I was practicing and a little bit of support when I was performing. But when I discovered Kathy's approach, I just felt like it was, I'd only been doing 10%. Yeah. And just to, if I can interject a per, another personal note here, I, w I trained in England in the late uh, 70s, early 80s. And I don't remember ever hearing anyone on my training course ever talking of using the word inhibition. It just wasn't there. Um, the only place I, in retrospect, encountered it uh, was with, um, I did take some lessons with Patrick McDonald. Yeah. I, the tra my training course was a Walter Carrington offshoot. He sponsored it and he would show up there. And I had, I went to his 
his training course, you know, a number of times a year. And but I also had lessons with McDonald, who was taught in a very different way. And he would he would when he use he used, you know, he did chair work and table work and lunges and this and that. And with chair work, he would say, okay, I'd be standing in front of a chair and he'd say, okay, uh, I'm going to take you in. Uh, I'm going to, I forget what exact word, something I'm going to take you into to the chair and your job is to say no. And you're not doing it. And the, the problem he had with me is I took that as just resisting it. And right. he had a, work around that and then he would finally get me to just you know say no but not actually fight him in that process. right well that sounds like a very unclear instruction. it was unclear but it was his way of working but i think that was inhibition taught by his version of it um and you know, Marge, when I got when I first met Marge, of course, she didn't talk. She never mentioned inhibition either. And and no. to be honest, this was like maybe maybe a good 10, 15 or more years into teaching. Inhibition was not something I gave much thought to, although I know in, in the Alexander world it's really considered important. But the other thing I'd add to the mix was that. Another, another of Alexander's students, Margaret Goldie, who I think you mentioned once or twice in the book, but your book is not primarily about her. She was off on her own in London at that time and critical of everybody else, mainly because they weren't teaching inhibition the way she felt it should have been taught. And I never had lessons with her. I wish I had, but mm -hmm. I've read a lot of her stuff, you know, accounts of lessons with her. And I wish now I had, but her take on inhibition seemed to be something different from sort of the mainstream teaching method in London and also maybe a little different from Marge. Barstow, and I don't know, I, I don't feel like I can really specify exactly what that difference is, but she was very critical of other training, all of them, she said. She even said, quote, I think we should just get rid of all the training courses, and then maybe we could start one up that actually taught the real deal or something like that. Right. It was very outspoken in her own way yeah I, I yeah you're right I didn't really focus on her I met, I've mentioned her occasionally when she was relevant to talking right. about Marge and Frank and, and Dewey but um to go back to Patrick McDonald yeah and the instruction that he gave you but my over overwhelming sense of that instruction that he gave you was was complete confusion and one of the chapters in my book about Marge is called Making Ideas Clear, which was one of the pillars of philosophical pragmatism, which was to make ideas clear. And so Marge did that as well. And when I say so, I don't mean Marge labelled herself as a philosophical pragmatist or even aligned herself with Dewey. That's my doing, that I've, where I've aligned mm, her with, right. with Dewey's thinking. But um I just, I still just marvel at the at the alignment of Marge's teaching with with John Dewey's thinking, uh, and that's my first chapter on Dewey's principles in Barstow's teaching, making ideas clear. So I think I even quote Patrick McDonald at the head of one of the chapters, where he's describing a student who comes out of a lesson with Alexander, and says that he can't understand. He said, uh, Alexander's a wonderful man. He's just had an, a lesson with FM Alexander and the student comes out and says, FM's a wonderful man. He's a wonderful man, but I can't understand the word he says. And Patrick McDonald's response to that is, yes, and you really shouldn't understand what an Alexander teacher says to you at first. So in mm. my understanding, <laughs> and I should qualify everything I say about yeah. that because I never met much, she would have been totally impatient uh, with that as a as an idea about a, a first Alexander technique lesson, she that would you confuse she the would definitely would not have 
And so what I see that she did with inhibition was was to in order to clarify it, she stopped talking about it because there was so much um, so much baggage in it, and I don't think it's a very useful term, and it's especially not a, a, a helpful for performers. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the Alexander technique is such an amazing gift to performers that why would you want to put performers off by using that word? Um, you know, another example of someone who um, saw the problem of, of uh, another teacher who completely got that issue of students not understanding what he would have talked about if he did was Walter Carrington. Walter Carrington once told me that when he had a new student, he would do everything possible for roughly the first 10 lessons or so to avoid any discussion of anything to do with the Alexander technique. Right. His, his strategy was you just get him in and out of the chair and maybe some table work and that at, at some point they would get some benefits from that. And, and for sure they, they did. And then at some point, you could start introducing uh, Alexander concepts and talking, but you, it wasn't worth trying right away. I disagree with that fundamentally, but I think for him, the way he taught the, his nature, his, his clientele also, which was mostly older people, may have played a part in that. Marge, Marge's clientele was, I'd say, mostly younger people. Right. Uh, yeah. So part and of it, it gives you know, the... has to do with who you're teaching and what the situation. Of course, she Marge was working in groups, and Walter was not. He was, you know, he probably had private that, lessons yeah. in his office. That is one way of dividing, like to say that it's about the clientele. But I still think that doing what Walter Carr what you say Walter Carrington did gives a, di a totally different message about what the Alexander technique is if it, if it's totally passive for the student and you're not speaking mm -hmm. you're just doing something to the oh, student oh he did it speak gives, that's Walter oh, he did was speak. A okay, he just didn't mention the other, but did yeah, he talk but about he didn't what talk he about the he talk about other things right yeah. Walter, so was he doing what Alexander did Walter's lessons consisted of him doing Alexander stuff with you and him go some pretty soon after the beginning of the lesson, a little patter would come start a kind of a he would just kind of go off in odd tangents, but I think it was kind of effective for what he was doing. And he would always end exactly on the half hour when the lesson was over. It was kind of a tour de force what he was doing. Mm. Now, when he was working with someone like me, who was a teacher trainee, he obviously said a lot of different things that he would to a new student. But he had this little talk. He would give a, a, a talk and it was different each time. Uh, and somehow it worked. I mean, he, he had a certain kind of personality that would allow for that, where, where that worked for him. I, I would go crazy doing that. I would. Yeah, well, I mean, to a certain extent, when you teach, you are teaching yourself. So, I mean, there, yeah. there's validity in just doing your thing and yeah. just, I don't know, passing whatever it is on yeah. that the student needs. Mm -hmm. But... Um, but I still think if someone signed up for an Alexander Technique lesson or a piano lesson, for that matter, mm -hmm. then there there is, for me anyway, I'm not talking about anyone else, but I, for me I would expect to learn about the Alexander Technique or I would expect to learn about how to play the piano rather than have what, what I heard. I mean, I've read from what I've read, it seems that Alexander would talk about anything and everything while he was working on a student rather than working with a student, and that's, like talking about everything but what's actually going on yeah. then precludes working with the student. It means you have to work on them as if you're giving them a massage because, you know, the kind of conversation you might have with a masseur while you're having a masseur, yeah. yeah. if the masseur speaks, um, 
some some are silent and sometimes I don't want to talk if I'm having a message but that kind of you know you can just talk about anything while they're working on you but I think if you do that while you're teaching the Alexander technique you're giving the message that it is like a massage and the student doesn't need to do anything mm -hmm. and there was a kid in in Frank Pierce Jones's book where he describes, Frank Pierce Jones describes, well, quotes uh, a boy in the Stowe School, I think it is, mm -hmm. um, who said that Alexander would just basically entertain them while he walked around and talked about how terrible the food was in America and anything, anything not actually pertaining to l learning how to use the Alexander technique. Anyway, we've strayed yeah. from the topic of inhibition. Yeah. Well, you know... Uh... One of the th in your book, you mention a quote by Alexander that I had overlooked. It's in his the Bedford lecture. It's in yeah, so it's available in articles and letters that book where he's he's demonstrating his technique to a person from the audience who I think they were all like physical education students yes uh, yeah that, yeah and he says something like okay when you sit down you're gonna we're gonna sit down and you're going to think i'm not sitting down or i'm just when he when he gets close to the chair i'm just gonna let the chair support me i'm not but not any i'm sitting down more like uh, almost like I'm not sitting down pretty close to that, which would be I'm not sitting down would be, I think, a classic negative direction. Yeah. Phrase. And the other place where he sh kind of illustrates direction is there's a, an aphorism or a quote where he I, I think one of his students says Oh, I see. When I'm not breathing, I'm breathing. And apparently Alexander thought that was exactly right. In other words, if you think I'm not breathing, another negative direction, and, and that's all you do is just think it. You don't stop breathing. You just, yeah, I'm not breathing. With a little help, most people immediately will notice uh expansion in uh, full more fullness in their breath often quite dramatic especially if you're lying down or sitting in a chair or something you're not doing a lot of, of movement so i think he i think he didn't pull it together well and as you said he had different versions and to quote walter again i used to ask walter well how come he didn't change that if something if he thought it was you know, if, if if someone said, hey, that's really not a smart thing to have said. And and Walter said, well, Alexander's take on it is when I write a book, I'm writing about what's going on right now. And I don't want to go back and change stuff, which isn't entirely true because he did go back and change stuff, but he didn't mm -hmm. change a lot of things. And yeah, so some of them, prob his more problematical writings got repeated in later editions. So, you know, we're dealing, I think we're dealing with, with inhibition. It's like he had ideas about it. They changed, but he wasn't terribly good at it, at actually giving simple, concrete examples that anyone could grasp right away. Whereas with negative directions, you can do that pretty quickly with many, not all, but many students. Yeah. Um, although do I do that. like, I mean, the example that you gave of him just now, just saying, um, instead of saying, I'm going to sit down, you're going to say, I'm going to let the chair support me. So that was a really great example of something of Alexander, re like clarifying and making an idea clear, but also replacing an old plan with a new plan. Exactly. So in effect, that's him inhibiting without calling it inhibiting. He's replacing an old plan, which is mm -hmm. sitting down and has that term has a whole lot of baggage and, and neuromuscular bundle and uh, muscle memory and all that associated right. with it. Right. And if you change it, that's him demonstrating a yeah. really constructive uh, inhibition. So I'm going to let the chair support me is using words. And he did, he was some, see, sometimes he was really creative and invented words and 
um, clarified words. And I that and that's the bit that one of the bits that Marge picked up on and continued. Whereas I think uh, many people are against the fact that she changed the language, like she didn't talk about inhibition. She just did what she thought he meant by it. Yeah. Um, and yeah. so she took that example, like he's, he was really creative and constructive in that way mm -hmm. some of the time in, in, in that example yeah, you just gave. Exactly. And she took that and ran with that and then, yeah. And we That's should say like that, you know, stop. in that original quote, uh, she does sound kind of critical of, of FM and AR, but when you, as someone who was hanging out with her and you ask, you would, people would ask her, well, what was Alexander like and what was AR like? What was the difference? She never got into that. She basically yeah. said they were both great. You know, they, she didn't go in and say, well, you know, FM's kind of isolated there in this little Alexander world and I, yeah. I'm more. She never, ever said that publicly. Yeah. Uh, because there was no reason to. I mean, she she never did anything just to kind of puff herself up. It was more, yeah. she was experimenting, she was trying new things, she was always changing how she taught in response to what she encountered. Yeah. And I think, you know, this whole inhibition thing has really, um, at this point, uh, the, with the with the arrival of of say negative directions in, or sometimes called inhibitory directions, and we have to credit, um, boy, who I can't think of her name now, teacher in Massachusetts. I can't who wrote the, wrote a book and included that in there, and that sort of started the whole idea of negative directions as being a useful thing. And other types of directions that are not negative directions, but also could be said as a, a kind of inhibition. So I, I think you have to leave, right? <laughs> teach? You have to teach French? <laughs> uh, I'm, yeah, well, I'm not actually on today, but I have um, yes, it, lots okay. of things to do to do with my teaching yeah. and other projects. So is there any final thought you want to? say about this whole inhibition question i well the thing i said last which which was came from you actually you you're giving the example of alexander changing sitting down to a different like reconstructing <laughs> which is another chapter of my book reconstructing um language reconstruct so if dewey john dewey reconstructed philosophy and I liken that to Marge reconstructing the Alexander technique, but she got that from Alexander. So that's an example of Alexander reconstructing. The, and I think reconstructing is a much more uh, helpful term than inhibition. So he right. was basically reconstructing sitting down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that was one of the things that Marge took from Alexander, which I think is one of the, the most useful and helpful things and made that one of the pillars of her teaching. Yeah. Well, let's end on that note. <laughs> um, my guest today has been Amanda Cole. And we're going to, this is our fourth conversation. And we're going to have, uh, I think, a few more in a month or two kind of time. Oh, Thank you so much, Amanda. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Robert. Take care.